one of the hardest but also one of the most necessary parts of developing meditation as a skill is at the end of each session to reflect on at what point in the session the mind was most settled, felt the greatest sense of ease, was quietest, was most alert. So you can remember to try to recreate that the next time around. It's hard because we often don't know what to look for. We just think about that was a really nice state of mind. And then we try to clone it, but it doesn't work. And then we get frustrated and we think, well, maybe the desire to have that state of mind is a bad thing. We try not to have any desires, but then we don't develop meditation as a skill. It's not bad to have that desire. It's part of the desire of right, right effort. And the key to this knows one, <coughs> excuse me, lies one in knowing what to look for to begin with. And then two, when you find that your mind in the next meditation session is not at the same place that you want it to be, it's getting a sense of where it needs to go, what's lacking. And one of the keys for this problem lie in that third tetrad of the Buddha's instructions on breath meditation. It builds on the first two tetrads. Remember the first tetrad, you're focused on the body. Trying to be sensitive to the breath, sensitive to the whole body as you breathe in, breathe out, and then calm the process of bodily fabrication, i.e. calm the effect that the breath has on the mind. So it has a sense of ease, well-being. In the second tetrad, you're focusing on that sense of rapture and the sense of well-being. Notice how they have, have an impact on the mind, then try to calm that impact. And that gives you the background for dealing with the third tetrad, which is being sensitive to the state of your mind. It starts with that instruction, breathe in, sense into the mind, breathe out, sense into the mind. Kind of notice, where is your mind right now? What's the state? Can you compare it to where it's been before? Can you tell whether it's irritable? Can you tell whether it's sluggish? Can you tell whether it's flighty? It gives you an idea what direction you want to go. And then with the remaining three steps, there are three alternatives for how to get the mind back in the right place. The first is gladdening the mind. Okay, remember that. What are the things that fabricate your state of mind? There's feeling and there's perception. Where do some feelings come from? We get some feelings from the way you breathe. So if you find that the mind is feeling sluggish or depressed or just kind of discouraged, what can you do to gladden it by the way you breathe, to create good feelings, and by the perceptions you hold in mind? In some cases, these perceptions might be dealing with the breath. In others, you may have to take a little time out from the breath and think of some other theme that gives you encouragement. You think about the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. You can think about your past virtue, your past generosity, things that you find uplifting. And then you can come back to the breath with this better state of mind. If, however, the mind is feeling overly excited, overly energetic, then you will figure out some way to breathe, steadying the mind. And again, this might have to do with just the way you breathe or the perceptions you hold about the breath. Or you may have to deal with some other topic. Death is a really good one for steadying the mind. Death could come at any time, and it could cut short all kinds of things in your life. I was reading today a comment. Someone was commenting how if you see aging, illness, and death as dangerous, it's a sign you're attached, isn't it? Whereas instead you should see aging, illness, and death as just a part of this wonderful life we have, and so you have to embrace it all. That's not a Buddhist teaching. The Buddha says you've got to see danger and death. You realize it's got to cut things off very quickly. It could happen at any time. A little clot of blood could get the wanderlust. 
and start going around your system and then get lodged in the heart or lodged in the brain someplace, and that's it. You don't have time to say goodbye to anybody. You don't have to time, any time to say, give any last-minute instructions or requests. You're just out, and you have no idea where you're going. And unless the mind has been really well-trained, you have no idea how you're going to react at that point, whether you can trust the mind. If you can't trust the mind to sit here, meditate for an hour, to settle down, it's going to be really hard to trust it when an event like that comes. So thinking about that gets you more focused on what you've right, got, <clears throat> got to do right now, which is get your mind in shape. That can help to steady the mind. So again, you're using the breath, you're using feelings, and you're using perceptions to get the mind into the shape that you want. Then over time you get a sense of what works in lifting your level of energy, what works in calming down your level of energy. The Buddha talks about using the factors for awakening, the ones that lift you up are persistence, or rapture, analysis of qualities. When you're trying to figure things out, in other words, your mind is sitting here getting kind of sluggish, and you give it work to do. Figure out something, what's going on. Is the breath getting to the right places right now? What parts of the body are lacking in breath energy? How can you make up for that? In other words, you pose questions, and then you act on the answers you've got. And if you act on it well, then there will be a sense of rapture. Yeah, those are the energizing factors for awakening. The calming ones are calm, concentration, equanimity. And ask yourself, what kind of fabrications will calm you down? Where is the, as the Buddha said, the potential for calm right now? Where is the potential for solidity in the mind right now? Where is the potential for equanimity? Ferret those things out, and you find the mind gets a lot steadier. The last step in this tetrad is releasing the mind. Basically, it has to do with burdens or things that are holding the mind down or holding it back. And release can be of basically two sorts. There's temporary release and then there's total release. Temporary release is so when the mind has been burdened down with thoughts of your work, your thoughts of school, thoughts of responsibilities at home. And you can just get the mind out from those things. I talked today about having that perception of wilderness. You only stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon, and a lot of your concerns at home and at work seem very, very small. Even though we're not here at the edge of the Grand Canyon, we are sitting under this enormous sky. It's good to go out sometimes and just look up at the sky, get a sense of how enormous it is, how immense it is, and how small a lot of your problems are. That can uplift the mind and take some of the burdens off. Or you might be burdened with thoughts of sensual desires. This is going to prevent you from getting into concentration. As the Buddha himself said when he was beginning to practice, and he knew that it was, should get the mind into a state where he was putting sensuality aside, but his mind was still resistant. And as he said, he had to look at the drawbacks of sensuality. And the advantages of getting past it. And so this is why we have the contemplation of the parts of the body, have contemplation of the aging of the body, all the illnesses that the body is subject to. And then you realize, well, the problem is not so much the objects for which we feel desire. It's this attitude of hungering for things itself. That's where the real problem is. So you want to look at the drawbacks of that, what that does to the mind. And when you can see that it's really not a state that you want to be in, then it's a lot easier to get past it. This is one of the reasons why John Lee recommends the reflections that give rise to a sense of some way at the beginning of the meditation. So you can think through some of the issues that might come up in the meditation and look at them from an angle that shows you that 
if you don't get the mind trained, you just keep coming back. You're slave to craving, like King Gauravya, 80 years old, and yet he's still he could think about wanting to conquer all the lands in all directions around him, and even lands over and across the other side of the ocean. All for what? A lot of killing, a lot of mayhem, and then he dies. And although we may not want to engage in killing and mayhem, we, our lives do involve a lot of struggle. For what? For a few sensual pleasures, and they were gone. And when you think about that, that gives you a greater sense of sun and It's a lot easier to get past sensuality, so the mind is willing to settle down, just be with the breath, not be constantly disturbed by thoughts of going back to sensual pleasures. And that's where the breath meditation gets you into the, the first jhana. From there you can go to the other jhanas by looking at the things that are burdening the mind within those jhanas. Don't be too quick to try to analyze the state of concentration when you get into it. Just see what you can do to keep it going. And as you get more and more proficient at keeping it going, then you can begin to notice what in here is still a necessary burden. How can I stay concentrated but with less effort, do it more efficiently? When you've worked through all the wrinkles of the breath, You can settle down without having to think about these things. You don't have to do any direct thought or evaluation. Just be one with the breath. Okay, that releases the mind from the need to do direct thought and evaluation. There, may still, there should still be a sense of rapture there. Okay, then that, that, after a while, the rapture becomes tedious. It's like food. When you're really hungry, you want as much rapture as possible. When the body is really tired, you want as much as possible. But then there comes a point where the body's needs are met, the mind's needs are met. Okay, then it becomes tedious, it's like having too much food. You don't want to eat anymore, so you can stop that. Tune the mind into a more refined level of the breath. So get underneath the radar, and you can release the mind from the rapture. And so on down through the various levels of jhana. And it's the same principle with total release. You look for rise and fall in the level of stress in the mind and ask yourself, what am I doing when the level of stress rises? What am I doing when it falls? When you see that you're doing something together with that, then you let it go. It basically comes back to that principle of the rule. And we said, as I said earlier, this is the best way of dealing with delusion. You're not really sure where you, whether you know something, or you may think you're sure where you know something, but it won't put it into, into action. On the outside level, as the Buddha said, when you're going to do something, ask yourself, is this going to harm anybody? If you think it's not going to do any harm, you can go ahead and do it. But while you're doing it, look for the results that are coming up. If any unexpected harm comes up, then you drop it, stop it. If there's not any, then you can continue with the action until it's done. When it's done, you look at the long-term results. If you say that they're not what you expected, okay, you've learned something. You've seen through some of your delusion. It's the same here with the, the actions in the mind. You try things out. You thought you knew what went into a good mind state before, but you try it out. Well, if it doesn't work, then you go back and check it again. Because these things are fabricated. And our problem is that we're not. We're not fully aware of how we fabricate things. But with time, you get more and more sensitive. And it's trial and error. And then learning how to pose questions and learning how to ask yourself, okay, what is it that's, that I'm missing? But what went into this mind state? In terms of bodily fabrication, mental fabrication, what's missing here that I didn't see? And over time, you get better. You develop a skill. And this principle can take you all the way to total release. So always remember that states of the mind are fabricated. You've been putting them together for who knows how long. 
simply that you're ignorant of how you do it. And the Buddha's instructions on breath meditation, first three tetrads, give you some handles on figuring out, what, what am I doing as I create a state of mind? And how can I do it better? And you focus on the issues of the way you breathe, the perceptions you have, the feelings that these things give rise to. Those are three big things you want to watch, three thing, big things you want to look for as you try to get more and more in control of the mind. So as the Buddha said, you get the mind to the point where if there's something you need to think about, it'll think about it. If you don't want to think, it'll stop. And that way you can live with your mind a lot more easily. Because you know it a lot more thoroughly.